Safi. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Back in the late 1950s, if you had said that a Tucson building was built by such and such an architect, it would have been assumed that you were referring to a man. At that time, only 1% of registered architects in the U.S. were women. By 1970, little had changed, but that didn't phase Judith Chafee, who was on the cusp of a career that would result in the creation of some of Southern Arizona's most critically acclaimed modern homes. And yet, she struggled to gain acceptance in her hometown, Tucson. Well, back in October, we presented two short stories about Chafee. Producer Andrew Brown continued to work with the material, creating a documentary featuring more footage of her stunning homes and revealing the depth of some of Chafee's struggles. We present that to you now, the architect, Judith Chafee. When I walk into a Judith Chafee house at a different time or a different time in my life or a different season in the year, I always see something new. You see somebody's mind turning. You see an intentionality about how life could be lived in a place. Tucson is build it now, build it fast, get it done. And Judith was, oh, let me think about how I can make that idea like no other idea that's ever been built before. She was kind of the architect's architect. Anyone who was serious about architecture in town knew her and knew her work. 18 years after her death, people still really enjoy talking about Judith Davidson Chafee. Judith Chafee is a complex figure. She was not an easy person to be around, and I'm sure she didn't suffer fools gladly. If you were a fool, you were going to turn around and walk right out. That wasn't the place for you. She had certain expectations and certain standards, and. She was going to try to live up to them and expected everyone else to do so also. <laughs> That's hard. You either went elsewhere or you did what she said. When people heard we were working with Judith Chafee, they said, oh, how is it going? She was one of the most critically acclaimed and controversial architects to have practiced in Southern Arizona. She smoked, drank, cursed, and she built houses. If you called her Tucson's best female architect, she would have been highly insulted. Her life was all about architecture. I knew that I was dealing with somebody who was on a different planet, and I had nothing to lose and everything to gain by shutting up. She was the first woman from Arizona to be named a fellow in the American Institute of Architects, built record homes, AIA design winning homes, and her Ramada house was even put on the National Register of Historic Places. She's a great architect. Not just a good one, she's a great architect. Locally, however, she is most known for the controversy that once surrounded this piece of desert in the Tucson Mountains. Former old Tucson executive Jerry Blackwell commissioned architect Judith Chafee to design a house. What was built is widely considered to be one of the most significant examples of modern desert architecture. But the Blackwell House stood on land that Pima County wanted to make part of Tucson Mountain Park. So eight years after he moved in, the county essentially forced Jerry Blackwell to sell his house to the county. Since then, the abandoned house has been gradually looted. Something that might seem a little strange to you is I'm kind of proud of how well the house is, <laughs> is done <laughs> considering what's been done to it. I, I love concrete and um, I think the fact that this still has a feeling of place that fascinates people. The Blackwell House was loved by some, despised by others. One op-ed from the Tucson Citizen begged, bring on the bulldozers please, saying, to most, the home is downright ugly and doesn't belong there. It sticks out like a concrete and steel hulk of a sore thumb in a beautiful sea of desert. The way the house was very clearly tuned to its desert environment in a way that wasn't picturesque, it wasn't romantic in any way, 
it's a house that a lot of people in this community thought was very indicative of how you might live graciously in a desert environment. In 1993, the county still wanted to demolish this building, but a group of architectural students and faculty at the University of Arizona rallied to save it. We would like to see um, it being occupied, but in the way that the Parks and Rec recommends with low impact to the environment. Chafee moved to Tucson for the first time at the age of five. This adobe house that her family moved into would inspire her the rest of her life. That house and the way her mother created a life for their family there was really important to Judith Chafee. She found these, these very sort of subtle moments in that house that she took with her throughout her career. This idea of seasonally changing how you live in a house, how light came into that house. She would visit the home often later in life. Judith's mother, a Harvard-educated anthropologist, managed to introduce her daughter to many stimulating people at a young age, especially given Tucson's size in the 1940s. Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, lived nearby. She was introduced to architect Frank Lloyd Wright and even met Eleanor Roosevelt. There was a really intriguing sort of range of people here that were attempting to bring Tucson into the 20th century, and that was a really important part of her early growing up, watching her mother be an activist and attempting to change the city for the better. Judith's mother sent her to Chicago to attend the Parker School for her last two years of high school. She studied writing and visual art at Bennington College before pursuing her master's in architecture at Yale. Paul Rudolph, when she arrived, was the new chair of this Department of Architecture. And so she came to Yale at a really very important time in the development of the school, but also sort of her development as an architect. She also came through an uh, architectural education program that was totally male-dominated. She was the only woman in her class at Yale. Being the only woman wasn't easy, especially when she started winning awards. The dinner for this was at a men's club, and Judith was told to wait in the kitchen until the dean called her to receive her prize, and then to leave and go back out through the kitchen. But Chafee didn't let episodes like this define her. She wanted to be established as the architect, and not any other adjectives going along with that. After graduation, she worked in some of the biggest architecture firms in the country and started to develop her own private practice. Her very first house was on the cover of Architectural Record Magazine. A woman architect working in the late 1960s on the East Coast, the first project to be completed was on the cover of a major architectural magazine and also took a prize um, in that magazine. It was a very choice place to be at the time. Things seem to be prospering around here. New England villages as cleanly tailored as ever. Chafee wrote of New England, the sides of the road are perfect, placed stones, considered fences, the trees are beautiful. I think I will drown in the green muck. I think I will lose myself, my purpose, if I can't see something beautifully naked and clear. If I don't see the edge of space, the horizon. I go to the seashore and find the space of the desert. Just like that, Judith was headed back to Tucson. I so regret not just saying, Judith, why did you move back to Tucson? She was at the top of her game. She was beginning to start a career as a young architect in a place which was the center of architecture culture during that period in the late 1960s. It was um, kind of a mid-career decision that was pretty brave of her, I think, because she was a star back east. She was doing great work. And she kind of threw it all aside and came back home. She probably thought, I can do work in Tucson that I couldn't do anywhere else. And that was probably a very provocative sort of idea in her mind. I think she expected coming back to Tucson would be returning to old friends and neighbors and, and an easy settling in. And I, I don't think it was. But in the late 50s, when Judith Chafee went to school, she was the only woman in the class. 
She's had the distinction of working for some of the best firms in the East, and in 1970, she came West to make her own mark on Southwestern architecture. While Judith Chafee may not have received the welcome she expected back in Tucson, it didn't stop her from making a major impact on architecture in the region and building some of the most highly regarded buildings ever built in Southern Arizona. I walked in, you know, just off the street. She said, so where'd you go to school? I said, I went to Harvard Graduate School of Design. And she said, oh. And I started to take out my portfolio and she said, I don't want to see your portfolio. When do you want to start? <laughs> That was the end of the interview. And I said, can I please show you my portfolio? She said, no. Corky Poster worked for Judith for a year, but remained close friends throughout her life. Chafee's first project in Tucson was this office, and she did most of the work by hand. She purchased this fourplex of four buildings. She gathered those four residences into one compound for herself. The brilliant thing she did was tore off the roof of the third one, which is where we are now. So what used to be a, a long, thin, not very well lit row house became a courtyard uh, that provided light. It's just a brilliant idea. She invested downtown in 1970 while parts of the old barrio were being demolished and others were flocking to the suburbs. So in a way, it was a very activist thing to do, to purchase this property and say, I'm going to live here and I'm going to preserve this property. Chafee would eventually sell this office to Poster for his own practice. And nearly 50 years after she bought the building, architecture is still being practiced inside it. Her next project was a home for her mother on Tucson's west side, the Viewpoint Residence. When you're in this house, the first thing that stands out is, is the quality of light. There's something that she always did when she was designing a good room, and that was to bring light in from two different places. So you can see to the north, there's a series of clear stories that step up, and then to the south, there's a very sort of low line of windows that are protected by a concrete eyebrow that allows light to balance in the space. The house was, was oriented so it, it could exist in the desert, but also be protected from the harsh realities of it. It was her first building in Tucson, and it won a record home award. I walked into her office and this, I could almost hear the voice in my head. And the voice said, this, whatever this lady does, you are going to love. This is the Rumata house. Jane London is one of the last original owners of a Judith Chafee home. Judith wanted to build the Ramada house long before the Solomons ever appeared uh, in the office. And her attitude was, I want to build this house. And, Essentially, the next people that walk in the door are going to get the Ramada house. She pitched a few ideas, and we got to accept what looked me scary. Also, when we interviewed her, she didn't make disparaging remarks like, and now the little lady will be interested, we're going to talk about the kitchen. And that was a remark made to me by one of the other architects. So Jane and her then husband hired Chafee and agreed to the conceptual project. The decision paid off. The Ramada, constructed of log poles and the house below, are truly unique. And it was a very tricky design problem because there's a house uh, that sits below and then there's an entirely independent Ramada that is structurally independent from the house. For her to have designed this house on the 19 by 11 foot grid, where all the poles go through both stories of the house and above it, and make every pole enhance the space inside the house while holding up the Ramada, takes a huge amount of foresight, planning, math ability. It's the best modern house in Tucson. I, I don't think there's even a close second. The Ramada House was widely published, won an AIA Design Award, and would eventually be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Despite the critical acclaim, Chafee struggled to get major commissions, but kept building residences. It was hard for people in the field to recognize that she was capable, and, and she was very capable, but she had to really fight to get heard. 
she was very interesting, hard to describe. Joan Jacobson and her late husband hired Chafee to build a small but significant home in the foothills. We had a lot of meetings, uh, three or four maybe, about book storage. My husband and I both had a lot of books, and we figured we might be getting more, <laughs> which did happen. What are we looking at? The book steps. <laughs> the bookcase. Also, a st the steps to a loft up above. You can sit any place on the book steps and just push away the, the glass, push aside the glass to get to the books. That's how it works. One of a kind. <laughs> the Jacobson home and its peculiar bookcase was also widely published and won yet another Record House Award. It was very interesting working with Judith because she was so, so imaginative, so creative, and everything she's done seems to be different. This was on 40 acres, these ranchettes that are down in Sonoida. Catherine McGuire and Bob Diaz of Special Collections are organizing Chafee's archives under the University of Arizona Library. Their research is part of an effort for an upcoming book on the architect. McGuire had Chafee as a teacher at the University of Arizona, then went on to work as an architect in her office for 18 years. She knew her well. This home in Sonoida, the Heidemann residence, was in construction when she joined the office. One of the deed restrictions was that houses could not see another house. So you had to really keep your buildings low. Low, unobtrusive, and constructed of poured concrete, this home and its indoor greenhouse were energy efficient and had low impact on the surrounding environment. It fit the function perfectly, and it's a great looking house still. This was built in 1980-81. These magazines came with the house. This is the one that has our house in it. In 1984, Chafee built this home for Asher and Miriam Finkel. Miriam was a physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project. They retired here, and Miriam had issues with uh, sensitivity to all kinds of chemicals. And so Judith designed the house so it didn't have any uh, formaldehyde and glues. It was real hard finding materials for that house. The Finkel House, also known as the House of Glass and Steel, was carefully constructed of inert materials to cater to Miriam's chemical sensitivity. As we worked with them, we learned so much about chemical sensitivities and uh, how absolutely real it was. And again, this was 84 when the conversation wasn't out there. She had bad arthritis and that after living in the house for a year or two, she was much um, more able to use her hands and get around. When her husband died, people were asking her, well, I guess she'll move to something smaller. And she just would say to them, are you crazy? This is my house. This house keeps me healthy. Although some changes have been made, the current owners admit this house is difficult to leave. Where the house is and the environment that it's in and the wildlife that we see here. Every time now we go into another house, like, oh, this is so boring. <laughs> her favorite project is always the one under construction. And high in the Catalinas, she has her work cut out for her. Working closely with contractor James Hamilton, she is building a home with a bird's eye view. Chafee's next project, the Revishill House, had a large budget and understanding client and came at a good time for the architect. She had some great projects happening. She was teaching at the University of Arizona, and she was also a visiting professor at MIT. On the other hand, it left less time to focus on marketing, <laughs> um, getting things photographed. So this house really didn't get the attention. This house, designed for the man who invented Benadryl, George Rivashill did not win any awards because it was never entered. It is stunning nonetheless. Always getting the views in the right place and always having a sense of traveling through the building and what the spaces are that you feel and you're very aware. Chafee always got the views just right, but she also paid obsessive attention to the tiniest details. 
there's little things. How does the wall come down to the steps? There's this nice little reveal, so the wall just kind of floats above the step. It's a detail that just makes the whole story. Judith was just kind of sitting here and thought, wouldn't it be nice if you could just kind of look down there and see what's going on? Of course, right now it might be Havelina. It's keeping the, the experience inside, outside, all tied together, that it's, it's a big story. And then you have the, the chapters in the book. And this would be one, you know, coming out and going to the sun, see the sunset is, is a chapter in the book. But uh, it's all one big story. Over the next decade, Judith continued to work on small projects and teach at the University of Arizona College of Architecture. I don't like to dwell on how difficult it was for women at, at the time I went to Yale because I do teach architecture now and the situation is so different that I think it's um, a mistake not to be kind of full speed ahead. Judith as an educator is I would say equally as important as Judith as an architect. Teaching was very important to her. Architecture at the, you know, until World War II was a, a white male profession, uh, almost exclusively. Trying to make it not that was a lot of hard work. And Judith, without wearing her heart on her sleeve, was a pioneer in that. What she really wanted to do from day one was a school building some kind of elementary, junior high, some kind of school building. We applied for a few university projects in joint competition and came in second on a couple of them, but never got them. Despite all the acclaim and all the awards, the major public projects never materialized in Tucson. In recent years, the only evidence of people using the house is the graffiti they've left behind. In 1998, efforts to restore the Blackwell House had stalled, and the county again pushed to raise it. At that time, Judith had developed emphysema, and her health was deteriorating. I think it will be remembered in modernist architecture as a kind of strange series of events. We plan to, to, to return the area back to its um, original condition as, as much as we possibly can. Understandably disappointed, Judith Chafee says the home's demolition reflects a lack of architectural appreciation. When you want to take an architecture student or a child someplace in Tucson to show them, get their brains going about the subject, there just are not many places you can take them. And this was, this was one of the special places. To me, it's, it's unfortunate that with that thought in mind that that structure ended up in that location. Of course, that's the irony. If the Blackwell House were located somewhere else, it would not be designed the way it is, making such a singular and controversial statement. Months after the Blackwell House was raised, Judith Chafee passed away. She was 65. 18 years later, her legacy remains, and it is still taking shape and new meaning today. I find Judith Chafee to be fascinating. What a lot of people group together as ideas of sustainability. She was doing a lot of this kind of work in the 1970s and 80s and 90s before that term came about but that sort of careful understanding of how and why you build in a place is at the core. She was brilliant, and she never got to work on buildings that impacted more than two or three or four people. I just think she was way before her time. And there's a learning process that goes on with good architecture. There is a certain fear. There were times when we thought we had a tiger by the tail. but it's worth it. It's sort of like anything. It's, it's a bit of a leap of faith. And I think that Tucson could use a few more leaps of faith. From a professional point of view, our world would have been a lot better if she had gotten to work. Tucson certainly would have been a lot better if she had gotten to work on much bigger projects that affected many more people. 
to really give your heart and soul to your more than it wasn't a profession it, it was her calling and uh, she sacrificed a lot for that by her choice and it made it a hard life for her she died when she was 65 that's that's sad that's real sad and uh, and we miss her she was brilliant and it's a shame uh, some of the work that could have been done that didn't get done Chafee once wrote, Why did you do it? If you fully understood this, you would be bored and go on to something else. It is the becoming that is important. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, a special presentation of Arizona Illustrated's 2016 Emmy winners. I don't know what it is about this case. I just feel some type of connection to Karen. At StoryCorps, we say that listening is an act of love. It's the power of, of that moment together when people are stopping and listening. We're very fortunate, we're so blessed. When I walk into a Judith Chafee house at a different time or a different time in my life or a different season in the year, I always see something new. You see somebody's mind turning, you see an intentionality about how life could be lived in a place. Tucson is build it now, build it fast, get it done. And Judith was, oh, let me think about how I can make that idea like no other idea that's ever been built before. A career that would result in the creation of some of Southern Arizona's most critically acclaimed modern homes. And yet she struggled to gain acceptance in her hometown, Tucson. Well, back in October, we presented two short stories about Chafee. Producer Andrew Brown continued to work with the material, creating a documentary featuring more footage of her stunning homes and revealing the depth of some of Chafee's struggles. We present that to you now, the architect, Judith Chafee. Chafee. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Back in the late 1950s, if you had said that a Tucson building was built by such and such an architect, it would have been assumed that you were referring to a man. At that time, only 1% of registered architects in the U.S. were women. By 1970, little had changed, but that didn't phase Judith Chafee, who was on the cusp of a career. She was kind of the architect's architect. Anyone who was serious about architecture in town knew her and knew her work. 18 years after her death, people still really enjoy talking about Judith Davidson Chafee. Judith Chafee is a complex figure. She was not an easy person to be around, and I'm sure she didn't suffer fools gladly. If you were a fool, you were going to turn around and walk right out. That wasn't the place for you. She had certain expectations and certain standards, and. She was going to try to live up to them and expected everyone else to do so also. <laughs> That's hard. You either went elsewhere or you did what she said. When people heard we were working with Judith Chafee, they said, oh, how is it going? She was one of the most critically acclaimed and controversial architects to have practiced in Southern Arizona. She smoked, drank, cursed, and she built houses. If you called her Tucson's best female architect, she would have been highly insulted. Her life was all about architecture. I knew that I was dealing with somebody who was on a different planet and I had nothing to lose and everything to gain by shutting up. She was the first